introduce uh, Angela Brackenreed. She's the agronomy specialist here in Manitoba for the Canola Council of Canada. And she's also taken the lead on uh, harvest management and storage in terms of uh, pulling together information for our crop production team and networking with some of the researchers on on the new work going on related to that topic area. So we've invited her uh, to give us a, she's going to start off the presentation this afternoon and cover uh, some of the general information around uh, deciding uh, when to swath and if you're thinking about straight cutting, uh, determining whether or not uh, a particular field is a good candidate for trying that. And then I'm going to take over toward the end and talk a little bit about some specific late season pest issues and in particular how those might affect some of those decisions in terms of harvest management and then I'll finish up uh, with just a few highlights talking about managing harvest losses as we head into the harvest season. So with that I will uh, let Ali switch things over and we'll turn things over to Angela. Okay, hi everyone. Um, as Derwin said, I'm Angela Brackenweed. I'm the agronomist for Manitoba, and my area of research is the um, harvest management, so reducing losses and, and that type of thing. So first I'm going to talk about um, swathing, and then I'll switch to uh, decisions with straight cutting canola. So give me a second here, I'm just going to get some things moved around on my screen. Okay, so first, um, why we swath canola. Um, as you all know, it's common practice to swath canola, and I would say um, almost 100% of people who have canola have swathed it at one point, even if they're direct cutting now. Um, and, and the biggest reason is just to reduce risk. Um, swath canola is just so much less susceptible to wind damage. It would take extreme winds to roll swath canola in most cases. Swathing is also preferred when you have a lot of acres, uh, which all seem to ripen at the same time, it seems. Um, most producers have the seeding equipment to get a lot of acres in the ground really quickly, um, but not as many producers have that same ability when it comes harvest time. So swathing can just really make the timing of harvest a lot less critical. Um, it's also, it also makes it easier to manage fields that have variable maturities, um, and it uh, helps to manage green weeds by letting them dry down after cutting. The next thing we want to talk about is swath timing, and I know you all hear about this over and over again, but I think it's important that, that we talk about it. Um, swathing canola is something that's been practiced for quite some time, but we all still make errors in timing swathing every year. Um, likely that's a function of the number of acres that each indiv individual producer now uh, manages. So the Canola Council recommends swathing at 60% seed color change on the main stem. Uh, the first thing that you need to remember is that canola matures from the bottom upwards. I'm just going to go through to the next slide here. Um, so this is just a picture of the main stem of the canola plant that is at the perfect stage for swathing. So what you want to do to accurately assess swath timing is go to representative areas in the field and, and just check a few plants. Uh, so start by checking the main stem. Divide that main stem into thirds and crack open a few pods from each third. The seeds in the bottom third should be totally turned color. In the middle third, they should almost be completely changed, and the seeds in the top third should still be green. Um, but you want to take the seeds, the seeds from that top third, and roll them between your finger and your, or your thumb and your forefinger, and they should still be firm and pliable, um, and not fall apart when you roll them. So we'll just go through, and you can kind of get a visual of what uh, they look like on each third of the main stem. So this is the bottom. You can see they're all that nice dark color and you know that can be you can see differences with uh, different varieties but um, anywhere from a purplish to a brownish black color is typically what you'll see. This is the middle of the stem and uh, the top here. So just go back here. Um, you've probably all noticed that every year there seems to be differences in how your varieties mature physically. A uh, plant may look really ripe on the outside while the seeds are still totally green on, on the inside or, or vice versa. 
So you really just can't make an accurate assessment of seed color change for your pickup truck. Even if you've grown canola for a really long uh, time, you may see differences. You actually need to get out there and, and start taking a look at the main stem and crack and open some pods. Um, there's varietal differences in how a plant is going to mature, and we'll also see differences with different environmental conditions. Once you began assessing seed color change, you want to go back out every day or every other day. Uh, we typically will get about 10% seed color change every two or three days, uh, but that can happen a lot quicker in hot and dry conditions. Um, so if you want to get an idea if, you're, you know, if your canola is flowering right now or if it's stopping flowering, if you want to get an idea when you might be swathing, typically from end of flower until maturity in Manitoba is about 25 days, 30 days in Alberta and Saskatchewan, somewhere in between that. So anywhere from 25 to 30 days from the end of flowering until maturity. So when we talk about seed color changes, assume that, that we know this, but um, it's very possible that some people you know, may mistake some of these seeds for not turning yet, but any seed that starts to show that darker coloration is considered change and will contribute to that percentage seed color change. So you can see here there's, there's five seeds. I would say four of those have turned color and would uh, contribute to your seed color change percentage. The next thing I'll just talk about is um, some problems and dilemmas we're faced with um, when we're trying to swath our canola. We'll often see stagey fields, thin stands, high levels of diseases, or have weather patterns that make it tricky to decide when to swath. So we'll just talk about some of those quickly and, and how to kind of manage that. So in Manitoba this year, the major issue producers are faced with, I think, right now with canola is uh, uneven maturing stands. Uh, there, you know, we have high plant populations, but if you walk through the field, there's lots of different um, maturing areas throughout the field. Um, there's many reasons for this. There's some reseeding done. There's you know, uneven emergence and just multiple stresses throughout the growing season. So if this is the case in your canola field, you want to delay swathing until the least mature areas have at least some seed color change in those lower pods. Um, but you only want to do this if it isn't putting the rest of your crop uh, at risk of shattering. So uh, you want to try to determine where you feel the majority of the yield is in your field. And do this by visiting the areas that have the most obvious maturity differences. Take note of the percentage of the field you think they account for. So you can even do that kind of by standing at the road or or stand on top of your truck or whatever. Uh, do an assessment of the number of main stem pods and compare that to the number of branch pods. And keep in mind that the majority of the yield typically comes from the main stem pods. But to be sure, just crack, and open, crack open some pods on the branch and the main stem to compare the number of seeds per pod. So when you're in each area, you also want to take note of the seed color change. And once you've collected all that, da all that data from representative areas, Decide where you feel the majority of the yield is going to come from and just time it to that area. So um, definitely take a pen and paper with you because it can start to, all those numbers might start to get confusing. So the next thing I'll talk about is uh, swathing thin stands. And it's definitely not a problem in Manitoba, but uh, it certainly could be in Saskatchewan or Alberta, I'm not sure. Um, so how do we swath a field with real, really low plant populations? It creates a problem for timing, but it also can be dip difficult um, to properly anchor that swath. Remember that low plant pop with low po plant populations, canola is going to branch like crazy. Uh, so remember that as well as maturing from the bottom to the top, canola also matures from the middle outwards. So this means that with more branching, you're going to see more green seeds. In the case of a very thin stand, you'll likely want to assess seed color change on the entire plant and not just the main stem. Uh, the seed color change on the main stem will be past that 60% seed color change by the time the entire plant is at that 60% seed color change, if that makes sense. Um, but essentially, you just want to make sure you delay swathing until there's no la longer translucent seeds on those outer pods. Uh, but don't leave it so long that you're just waiting on a few seeds that really aren't contributing much to yield anyway. The next thing we'll just quickly talk about it, um, is swathing when you have high disease pressure. So typically, uh, when I say high disease pressure, we're talking about sclerotinia. Um, so the key is really just to target the healthiest plants that will produce the most yield in your field. 
Um, I know a lot of people talk about they want to swath early so that they can preserve uh, the seeds in, in areas that are badly affected, but um, that's really not going to do anything. And the main message is to really just forget those infected plants and continue to swath at that ideal timing for the healthy plants, because this is where your yield is going to be, and, and you just, uh, you know, those uh, infected seeds aren't going to contribute to your yield, so you just kind of have to forget about them. So when to swath uh, if it's hot and dry? So some are predicting this hot and dry weather pattern, uh, which we've been experience here in experiencing here in Manitoba, uh, is going to continue, which could make swathing even more of a challenge for sure. Uh, if it turns out to be true, when should we swath? If, uh, you know, so it's 30 degrees during the day, it would be optimal to wait until the evening to swath. The goal is really just to minimize the initial temperature and maximize the initial moisture. So if you can play with that dew in the evening and, and, and wait till the temperature drops in the evening, that's definitely ideal. And we have been getting cooler temperatures in the evening for sure. Uh, it's going to just slow down that desiccation process and allow more initial curing in the swath. Swathing in the heat will lead to rapid desiccation of the seed, and this can obviously lead to higher levels of green seed, as I'm sure you all know. Um, that chlorophyll just doesn't get a chance to be cleared from the seed. There is potential for the chlorophyll to be cleared again, though, if the seed moisture returns to 20%. So if you get a bit of a rain or some dew, then, then there is potential to, to clear some of the green. The worst combination, though, is to prematurely swath on a hot, dry day. That is really just going to lead to the worst yield and quality losses. So what do you do if there's a risk of frost in the upcoming forecast? Minus 2 degrees Celsius is considered a killing frost, and that will lock in green seed in standing canola and swath canola. Unfortunately, there's no potential to reverse this, as the enzyme that's responsible for clearing the chlorophyll, chlorophyll from the seed will be denatured um, with a minus 2 degree Celsius frost. As most of the damage from a killing frost occurs due to the freezing of the water inside the seed, the only way you can really avoid that damage is if the seed moisture is below 20%. Uh, so really, just to conclude, swathing to avoid frost is only effective if done 72 hours before the frost event. And I just say this because it may allow the moisture content to fall be below 20% in the swath before the frost event occurs. So um, if you've had a frost event and your canola is standing, uh, you'll want to wait four to six hours before assessing the damage. Pods that were badly affected will be white and wilted. Um, pod chatter could begin, with, begin within a day and will start to happen quicker if it's hot. So what do you do? You'll need to assess the situation in your own field, but there's a few cases we can kind of run through um, to get an idea of you know, the, the situation in your field. Um, Swath right away to avoid shatter losses if pods are desiccating rapidly and if you have seed color change on the main stem. Uh, wait to swath if the crop lower in the canopy wasn't hit as hard and is still green. It may continue to ripen and change color if less, less standing. So normally a fall frost um, doesn't go right to the ground, so that's why we say it may, may not have hit the lower canopy quite as bad. Um, you may also want to wait if the upper portion of the plant was severely damaged. I say this because you may just want to let these pods shell out to avoid having a high level of green seed. This is obviously just kind of a call you have to make on your own and it's just what you're comfortable with because there's going to be a large yield reduction, um, but an increased grade. You also want to put off swathing until the appropriate seed color change if it was only a light frost. You may see that white speckling on the pods and, and assume that there's been a bad frost, but it's, if it's just a light white speckling, and I'll show you a picture after this, it likely hasn't actually harmed the seeds. And so like I said, these are really only just suggestions and examples of what may occur after a frost event, but you'll want to scout closely in your own field to identify the extent of frost damage throughout uh, the canopy. So this is just showing that uh, white speckling that probably was just a light frost and, and these seeds will, will continue to mature as normal and clear that green seed. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is um, 
some candidates for straight cutting. And after all that talk of swathing and the pain that it can be, maybe some of you are thinking you'd rather just straight cut and leave that swather parked a bit longer. Um, if you're considering straight cutting, you'll want to assess your field just before swath timing. That way, uh, if you feel it isn't the best idea after all, you'll still be able to get out and swath at the appropriate timing. So if you have a thick crop that's well lodged, evenly matured throughout the field, well knitted and has little disease, it may be a good candidate for straight cutting. Um, if your crop meets the criteria for straight cutting, you'll see there's a, a bit of a list there, uh, you want to check the upcoming forecast to decide if you feel comfortable with the idea. A short, severely lodged or excessively branched canopy may also be a candidate as there could be minimal stubble left there to anchor if swath. Um, in that case, there might be a higher risk of wind damage to the canola if it's sitting in the swath um, than if it's left standing. So just some things to consider about straight cutting. Uh, one of the major bonuses of straight cutting is just the amount of time it shaves off. Uh, there is current research that shows that there's potential for increase in yield, quality, oil content, seed size, and a decrease in green seed when canola is straight cut. Um, but there are certainly, certainly risks that come along with the practice, uh, mainly shattering losses from pod splitting and pod drops. Other things you want to consider about straight cutting is that it has potential to delay your harvest as it can take longer to get below that 10% moisture content. Uh, you just really need to be sure too that you have the facilities to dry your canola because you may or more than likely will have to combine some of your acres tough. When you're combining the weeds may not be mature too which uh, can increase the moisture content and create storage issues. So um, you probably all kind of toyed around with or heard about uh, the different harvest treatments for um, reducing shad or reducing pod drop. So these are just this is just some data here from pod seal and pod stick. As you can see, there is no statistical difference uh, in the treatments. Um, but with that being said, you know there's not a lot of damage that can be done. So if it's something you want to try, um, you you'll want to leave it checked just to be sure that you're happy with the results or you know maybe do it again next year or not do it or, or whatever. So that's all I have um, for straight cutting and swathing canola and as Derwin said there's a, a little box there you can ask questions and we'll get to those after. Well thanks very much uh, Angela. I'll uh, there we go. Um, Ali switched things over. So um, I will uh, uh, take over now and uh, I'm just going to cover, uh, talk a little bit about late season pest management. Another thing as we head into the harvest season, uh, both from the standpoint, uh, talk a little bit about pre-harvest intervals and, and, uh, and those issues, but also a little bit about how pests may influence uh, some of the things that Angela talked about, and then wrap things up with a little bit of a discussion about some things you can do from an equipment standpoint to try and uh, uh, maximize the amount of seed that you put in the bin. So, um, and then at the end we will uh, have a Q&A. So, if you have any questions from what Angela has covered so far, by all means type them in right away, and. Uh, they're saved in the list, and and we will uh, we will answer those toward the end of the presentation. So, um, from my standpoint, in terms of late season pest management, I think there's uh, kind of three key questions that I came up with that you need to think about. Uh, it, often, what we're talking about is insect pest management, so late season outbreaks that happen just prior to uh, getting into swathing of the canola, and uh, one key thing, obviously, is is will control at that late crop stage really still provide an economic benefit? And uh, often, what happens is we go out, uh, as Angela mentioned, that 20 days or so after flowering's wrapped up to check and see if we're starting to see some seed color change, and and we identify in some fields that we've got some some issues that we maybe missed uh, 
with some uh, uh, lack of scouting a little earlier, and uh, and now we're wondering if uh, we need to intervene. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, give you a couple of examples of some of the key pests that we're watching this year based on on the feedback into our canola watch network and and uh, those those will serve as an example of what I'm talking about there uh, the next question is can that an application if I decide that yes uh, I might see an economic benefit from an uh, something like an inse insecticide application um, can that application adversely affect the quality of my product or the ability to market it. And that's really what our uh, export ready campaign is all about and our focus on making sure that growers are aware of what the pre-harvest intervals are for the various products and and make sure that uh, uh, growers are making uh, choices in terms of products uh, based on that in addition to relative e efficacy of the products that they have available to manage some of these pests. And then finally, uh, how might the pest affect my harvest management? So the damage that's been done either from an insect or I'll talk a little bit about diseases as well. Uh, a Angela alluded to the fact that in most uh, typical situations you're going to want to focus on the healthy plants in terms of that decision, uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So um, I've chosen a couple of uh, insects, uh, two key insects that came up in last week's Canola Watch report as, as uh, uh, having some outbreaks in different parts of the prairies. And uh, I, I chose them also because uh, they're very different, obviously different insects, but different in terms of the way that we scout for them and different in terms of their ability to cause damage as the plant starts to senesce. So uh, I thought I would start with Ligus bug. Uh, obviously for Ligus bug, the thresholds are based on a proper sweep net technique. Um, and so ideally you want to do a minimum of 100 sweeps uh, in, in the field, 10 different spots, 10 sweeps in each spot. And that's doing, uh, using a standard insect sweep net and doing a 180 degree arc, taking a step, reversing direction and doing another, doing that for 10 paces. And then doing the total count and, and averaging those out over those 10 locations. Um, it's important to sample several locations in the field to get a good average number of what the population looks like if, if you're late in the season and trying to decide if, if an intervention is still warranted. But we're fortunate with Ligus bug that the research has shown that there's really no significant edge effect with Ligus. The populations out in the middle of the field tend to be pretty similar to the populations around the edge. So if you're, if you're wading through uh, waist or chest high potted canola, um, that's good news. Um, conditions are important uh, because you're putting that sweep net, uh, any of you that have done sweeps will know it's pretty tough moving that sweep net through fully potted canola. So uh, if, you're, if you're strong and fortunate, you can get it in the full, full uh, diameter of, of the sweep net, but you're not going to get it much deeper into the canopy than that. If the insects aren't up and actively feeding in the top part of the canopy, uh, you're not going to capture them in, in those sweeps. Um, so um, the key thing with all insect thresholds is they've done the research to correlate the number of insects captured with that uh, method of scouting uh, to the, the yield impact that the insect has. And so uh, what we really want to do is ensure that we're doing our scouting following the similar protocol to the, the way the research was done. So that's where these ideal conditions come in. Uh, you want the ligus active in the canopy. So sunny, uh, fairly calm, uh, fairly warm, above 15 degrees Celsius. And typically those conditions are going to occur sometime between 10 a.m. And, and 6 p.m. At this later stage, when most of your canola is fully potted, uh, you should certainly still count the late uh, instars, so uh, the third to fifth instars, as well as the adults. Uh, earlier instars uh, are unlikely to mature enough to cause significant damage uh, prior to when we get to swathings. 
but uh, those later instars still have the chance to, to cause some feeding damage. And so what are we looking for in the sweep net? Uh, we've got an example here of an adult ligus. Uh, they can vary in color. They'll all have this triangle on the back uh, is something to look for, and this similar pattern with the wings and the way they fold up. Uh, this is an example of a, of a nymph uh, with, the, with the five dots, so that is one key thing to look for on those later instars. And definitely if you start to see wing pads developing, uh, that's a sign that you're getting more into those fourth and fifth in stars as well. So as those become more defined and, and easier to see, uh, you're definitely getting into those later in stars. Um, part of the reason the ligus tends to do less damage as the crop continues to mature is that once your crop is fully potted, um, the, the adults have piercing sucking mouth parts. So Basically, they're sucking the sap out of one seed at a time. And uh, earlier on, when the pods are newly forming, uh, a bit of feeding damage can, in some cases, lead to a, an entire pod being aborted. And so that increases the yield impact uh, from the feeding of, of those individual ligus. But as we get more mature, uh, they're really damaging individual seeds one at a time. And then as the plant starts to senesce, starts to take on that yellow color, the outside of the pod gets much more leathery and uh, those piercing sucking mouth parts have a harder time penetrating into those pods. So that will also tend to reduce your damage per, per ligus. You can see here some of the sap leaking out of, of this green pod. So that's the type of damage that uh, it causes and that's what leads to these little dark spots and you can see uh, the corresponding uh, shr shrinking up and, and browning of the seeds underneath as a result of uh, that sap being sucked out. Uh, as with most insects, there are other insects that can look somewhat similar. In the case of the ligus nymphs, the one that comes to mind is aphid. Um, typically the aphids are quite a bit smaller than, than the ligus nymphs, but even if you blow them up to approximately the same size. There are some key attributes, uh, much different looking antennae and, and these cornicles on the aphid are, are substantially different from what you see uh, on those ligus nymphs as well. So once you've identified what your, your counts are, um, there are good threshold tables available and the key thing I wanted to point out here uh, uh, these are available in our recent uh, Canola Watch reports at canolawatch.org, so you can have a closer look. Uh, but the key point I wanted to make here, I've used the example of uh, uh, $14 canola and, and $14 uh, per acre for a control cost, including insecticide and application. Obviously, both the cost and value can vary, and that's, that's the purpose of these tables. But the key point I wanted to bring out is that at that late flower to early potting stage, uh, our threshold is about eight ligus per 10 sweeps, including uh, the counts of, of those later nymphs. Once you get up to late pod stage, uh, it jumps up to about 11 ligus per 10 sweeps. So that's an increase of just under 40% in terms of the number of ligus uh, that to get the same amount of economic injury. So uh, it is important to recognize that those thresholds do go up as that crop matures. And that's good news uh, if we're talking about things like pre-harvest interval because uh, typically uh, by the time you're within the pre-harvest interval for, for the products with the shortest one available, uh, you're likely not going to see an economic benefit anymore anyway uh, to an application. Earth armyworm is, is quite a bit different. Um, um, you need to get out and get down into the canopy. Uh, you're looking at doing a typically quarter meter square, uh, section off 50 by 50 centimeters in at least three locations. You do need to get in off of the headlands uh, in three locations at least 50 meters apart and beat all the plants and then look down on the ground. And uh, uh, the larvae will tend to hide right in the bottom of the canopy if it's in the afternoon in the heat of the day. 
um, and they will tend to hide in cracks and leaf litter. And we've got a good video of that that uh, uh, Tiffany Martinka, one of our agronomy specialists, took last week just showing uh, how well they can hide down in under that leaf litter in the bottom of the canopy. Um, so um, much different in terms of how you scout for them. And the other thing about Bertha is they're much different in terms of their ability to cause damage right up. Uh, they can continue to feed in the swath until that swath starts to dry down. Uh, so it is a bit more of a challenge, and, and it's, so it's very important if if you feel you're at or close to threshold levels, you really do need to make that decision about intervening with an insecticide early enough that pre-harvest intervals don't become an issue for you. Uh, because it's the last couple of instars of those larvae before they pupate that do about 80% of the feeding damage. So uh, it's important also to scout each field. Uh, populations can vary greatly from field to field depending on what stage the crop was at when you had the, the peak egg laying from the moths and how attractive the field was. And uh, the other key thing to note is uh, the condition of both the larvae and uh, what stage the crop's at it when you're doing this late season scouting. Uh, and the larvae in particular, uh, there was just uh, an article in I believe the Manitoba Cooperator talking about uh, the fact that they are finding a number of diseased uh, birth armyworm uh, clasping the stems up high in the canopy. Uh, they can be attacked by a fungus, in which case they'll look fairly normal, but they're dead up on the canopy. If they're attacked by a virus, they'll often look melted onto the, the pods or the stems or they'll be hanging there like a, a bag of soup. So um, those natural uh, controls are uh, starting to have an impact in some of the areas where we're having some outbreaks. So uh, that's something else to keep in mind as you're doing your counts. So what are we looking for again? Uh, there can be quite a variation in terms of the general color of those more mature larvae. They can uh, stay fairly green or they can turn that velvety black uh, the key thing to look for is the yellow stripe down each side. And uh, here's an example of a fairly mature larvae that stayed fairly green, uh, but still has that uh, uh, yellow stripe down the side. There are a number of other larvae that can show up at those later stages. Um, this is an example of a cabbage worm from imported cabbage worm larvae. Uh, you'll see the small uh, fine hairs uh, over the body. These guys tend to feed on foliage, so uh, typically not an economic pest. Uh, the diamondback, the more spindle-shaped diamondback larvae can, can show up at this stage. Um, they tend to remain fairly small. They will do some surface stripping of pods, so uh, that can uh, contribute to uh, shattering and uh, in some cases to uh, uh, shrinkage of the seed or, or a premature desiccation of the seed below the, that surface that's stripped. So that can contribute to some yield loss, uh, but uh, certainly not to the extent that we see from the Bertha. And then uh, zebra caterpillar is another one that's shown up in a number of areas, tends to be very localized within fields. So uh, odds are this later uh, fully potted stage of canola uh, the odds of needing to intervene to control these are a lot lower than they are for the Bertha armyworm. Uh, just an example of thresholds again using that uh, uh, fourteen dollar uh, cost and, and fourteen dollar bushel price again. Uh, you come in at about seventeen larvae per square meter for the Bertha armyworm. Uh, Obviously, that can vary a bit depending on uh, what you feel you may get for price and, and what your specific costs are. But likely somewhere in that 15 to 20 larvae per square meter this year is, is going to be the threshold level for uh, intervening. And it's really important to, to use those thresholds, again, uh, to preserve those beneficials. There are a number of beneficial insects that can also attack the, the birth armyworm as well. Um, but if you are going to intervene, it is important to keep those pre-harvest intervals in mind for the products that are available. Uh, so using the two examples that I, I've included today, 
uh, for Ligus, these are your options in terms of insecticide. Uh, and you can see um, uh, you may typically favor a product like Lorsban that has a bit more residual activity. Um, uh, if you're uh, thinking about efficacy over a longer period of time, but those more residual products also tend to have a substantially longer pre-harvest interval. So uh, these products can be quite effective if they're applied at the right time of day when the insects are up and active um, and, uh, and certainly avoid any issues with uh, pre-harvest interval until you're quite close to uh, swathing. For the birth armyworm, uh, you've got more options, but they range up to as much as 30 days. And when we talk about pre-harvest interval, we're talking the time between uh, the last application of the product and cutting of the crop. So if cutting is swathing or if cutting is uh, cutting with the straight cut header, it's, it's that time between that last application and, and cutting of the crop. Switching gears a little bit to talk about uh, uh, late season uh, pest management from a disease standpoint, really what we're talking about at this stage is, is scouting for the incidence of the disease and what proportion of the plants are affected. Um, it's too late to intervene for this year, but that information can give you uh, um, an insight into whether you should make some changes in your management next year and again uh, help you determine uh, whether the level of disease in the field might warrant adjusting your, your ideal staging from a, a swathing or, or harvest management standpoint. So to get a, a better idea of that, probably you're going to want to go with uh, either this W or V pattern uh, throughout the field to get a, a, more, a better idea of the random uh, distribution of the disease throughout the field and a better overall perspective. Uh, with something like clubroot, for instance, if you were just looking for the presence of it, you might focus more on the entrance to fields where an infested soil might be coming in on equipment or low areas that tend to be wetter. Uh, but at this time of year, uh, certainly you want to know if there's patches out there but you, you're really looking more for that overall perspective of what proportion of my field is affected by the disease. And so I just have a series of pictures here in the interest of time. I'll run through them fairly quickly. Uh, these are all examples of sclerotinia. You can see the sclerotia inside the shredded stems. You can get basal uh, infection with sclerotinia that can resemble blackleg in some cases, but it'll tend to be that lighter uh, whitish gray color and you won't find the pycnidia, uh, the small black dots within those lesions. Um, and the key thing, again, uh, as Angela mentioned, is to really do an assessment of what proportion of, of the total plant population do these prematurely ripening plants represent. Seed set within these plants is going to be a lot less than it is for the healthier plants, typically. Uh, so even if they represented half of the plants that are out there, they wouldn't represent half of the yield. So normally you're going to want to uh, use the healthy plants as a gauge uh, of when to swath and, and then swath in the dew to try and preserve uh, these diseased plants. Um, blackleg, we've been hearing about some fairly severe blackleg. These are pictures, though, from back in 2007 in a field that I was in south of Notre Dame, Manitoba. Uh, so, you know, relatively severe blackleg isn't something new. Uh, it's a, a combination of selection pressure and uh, uh, ideal environmental conditions. So in a lot of areas, we did have uh, wet conditions and high humidities early in the growing season to spread those, uh, get those initial infections going and spread them throughout the field with the rain splash. And then we've had uh, subsequent dry conditions that are ideal for really aggravating those basal stem cankers and that dry rot. So um, again, uh, this is a severe example. What you'll see, um, you really need to slice open those stems to have a look. This is an example of uh, uh, virtually no infection, the odd small uh, discoloration 
uh, showing up that might rate a one out of five. Um, here you have much more severe infections. Many of these would be three and four where you have over half of the stem uh, discolored from the black leg. Having said that, in a lot of cases, these plants, the stalks are still quite green. Uh, the impact on yield, if you've had uh, reasonable moisture throughout the season, may not be that high on those individual plants. Uh, so it's really important when you're out scouting and assessing to slice through those, those crowns of the plants, and especially if you're seeing some surface lesions that you think are black leg, uh, to really determine how severe that, that is. Uh, in some cases, you may have surface lesions, but the genetic resistance may still be working fairly well, and, and you may not see a lot of penetration into those stems. And then club root for areas of the prairies where, where club root is present uh, can also show up as prematurely ripening patches. It's a disease that, uh, again, you want to look at the proportion of the yield that those areas represent. Um, but one thing to keep in mind with it, because it, it affects the roots, if you're seeing premature ripening, you're also likely in those areas going to have fairly severe gall formation. Uh, once those plants start to senesce and those uh, galls start to break down, there's really not much anchoring those plants into the ground anymore, and it can uh, create a lot of difficulties in terms of swathing those areas. So um, that's one uh, situation where you may look at uh, certainly not a good candidate in those areas to leave it until it's you know 60% seed color change. Uh, maybe more at our old recommendation of around 30% seed color change. Uh, ideally get in there while those galls are still uh, white and intact uh, so that those plants are anchored as, as, as much as possible uh, because you can really run into issues where the, the swather starts to pull those plants out rather than cutting them off properly. The one that we most often think of in terms of adjusting our harvest management is Alternaria black spot. This is an example of some premature ripening that from a distance you might think was one of the other diseases I've mentioned, uh, but a closer inspection reveals that you're, you're getting senescence of some of the pods due to some fairly severe Alternaria. And uh, this is just a close up of, of some of those pods. Uh, typically, we don't see really severe alternaria black spot, but there were some reports this year in, in a few fields. Um, and the key point with this is uh, you can see the, sh the shrunken plant tissue around all of these little black dots. That's desiccation of the plant tissue from those lesions, and that differential dry down uh, throughout the surface area of that pod really predisposes it to uh, splitting open and, and shattering loss. So uh, again, if you've got fairly severe alternaria black spot, if you've just got a smattering of dots on, on even most of your pods, probably you're not going to adjust your uh, swathing timing very much. Uh, but if you've got fairly significant uh, alternaria like this, then certainly this is a poor candidate for straight cutting, and it's likely not a great uh, candidate even for leaving till 60% seed color change. So uh, key messages, I think uh, 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 Angela covered, uh, you know, ideally we're shooting for that 50-60% seed color change. Uh, we really have to get out there and look at what's going on within the pods, and we need to look at the condition of the field and some of these other intervening factors, uh, physical damage uh, from feeding of insects that might compromise that pod integrity uh, and predispose it to shattering at, a, at an earlier stage, uh, hail damage, uh, been lots of hail and severe weather this year, and, and the disease issues that I've covered as well. Uh, straight cutting, um, uh, Angela did a great job of covering you know, the fact that each field, uh, not all fields are good candidates. Uh, she really covered well uh, what you would look for in terms of candidates for straight cutting and minimizing risk if you're looking at that as a harvest method. One last thing just on an equipment standpoint. Uh, I was uh, last summer at the International Rapeseed Congress. They've done a fair amount of research in Sweden looking at some of the things you can do from an equipment standpoint, above and beyond the routine things like uh, 
setting your reel back as far as possible, uh, ensuring that your speed is matched to your speed of travel so that you uh, uh, don't shell out uh, the pods prematurely before they get onto the table of the swather uh, or table of the combine, a straight cut header. Um, but there are some additions, you, uh, these end knives and, and extending the platform is something that they, they've been looking at. They've been doing a fair amount of research on this, basically looking at the distance between the front of the auger and the cutting bar and extending that platform to try and minimize losses during the harvest operation. So they've put out these pans uh, across the, the header. Um, and they put them in at the end of the plot so that the combine's running at full capacity when it passes over. And they've looked at where the losses tend to be the greatest. And what they found is it's really where it gathers in the center that you tend to see the greatest loss with straight cutting. Uh, where you have traditional crop dividers, you see slightly higher uh, losses outside of the, the cutter bar than uh, with the vertical end knife. The other thing the vertical end knife can help with is just uh, smooth feeding uh, because you tend to get less bunching on that crop divider and less issues with uh, having to stop and, and clear off uh, material when it's uh, bunching on the end of, end of the cutter bar. And uh, this just shows uh, from some trials I was involved with a few years back, this is an end knife and this is your traditional crop divider. And you can see that when the crop is dead rife, cer certainly there is a, a strip of, of shelled pods on every pass that can contribute to, to those harvest losses as well. Um, I think I'll skip over this. Uh, Angela really covered this well um, in terms of straight cutting. And so the last thing I just wanted to touch on uh, before we open it up to Q&A was uh, reducing the harvest losses. Um, uh, Les Hill uh, from PAMI has done several presentations for us at Combine Clinics really focused on how do we reduce losses during harvest. And uh, the key things that have come out for, for me are really uh, feeding the canola uniformly into the combine goes a long way to reducing our amount of loss. Uh, measuring how much loss we're actually getting accurately and consistently is important because as we make adjustments, if we're not doing a good job of uh, consist, if we're not consistent in our method of measuring um, and we're not accurate, well then uh, we really never know if those adjustments have improved the situation or not. And then finally travel speed and just determining uh, these two really go hand in hand. Uh, if you can accurately measure, then you can determine at what speed uh, those losses really start to climb and, uh, and set your, your speed appropriately for your crop conditions. So. Um, there are a number of other uh, key points that he points out and at the end of, of the presentation I'll provide a link uh, to some video and uh, an article that was put together that uh, goes into the rest of these in more detail. But I think the key point is in terms of feeding smoothly that all starts if you're swathing the crop it really does start with swathing, uh, laying a uniform swath, um, rolling it into the uh, into the stubble to anchor it, but not rolling it so aggressively that you tend to flip it over and, and cause bunching. Um, then it, it's about uh, setting your pickup, setting the speed. Uh, you don't want it to be so aggressive that it's shelling out uh, the pods underneath uh, before you get them into the throat of the combine, but at the same time, it needs to be slightly faster than your rate of travel uh, so that it's it's moving in smoothly and uh, um, not coming in and tearing off in bunches. In terms of measuring, there's a number of uh, ways to do that. Pretty common is the stick pan approach. Uh, um, and the key key point with this is to know what the area of this pan at the end of end of your rod is. Uh, the old scoop shovel, that's fine, but you really need to know what the area of that scoop shovel is accurately 
in order to uh, accurately assess how much loss you're getting. Um, the other extreme uh, is to go uh, to something like a, a mechanized drop pan that can drop below the combine. Uh, intermediate to this is the throw pan. The challenge there is to throw it under and get it uh, squarely under the middle so that it's measuring uh, properly and, and you don't run over it with the combine. When you measure that loss and you clean up uh, that sample that you get in, in your catch pan, um, one thing you need to know is, is your uh, the width of discharge from the rear of the combine compared to the width of cut. So if you've got a 30 foot swath and your width of discharge out the back of the combine is about five feet, that gives you a, a concentration factor of about six. And that's important as we, uh, we look at measuring that loss. So obviously the most accurate method for measurement is to actually weigh the seed, uh, the clean seed from, from those catch samples. And so if you're looking at 50 pounds or a bushel of loss with that six compression factor, um, you go across, it only takes about three, 3.1 grams of seed to equal a bushel an acre of additional loss. So um, you can use these little vials and, and do it volumetrically if you don't have a small scale that's accurate to a tenth of a gram. Um, and so that six uh, for a bushel an acre, about five milliliters of canola seed uh, will typically equate to a bushel an acre. Visual determinations are much less uh, accurate and less consistent. Um, if you look at the seed in the corner of a, a one foot square uh, catch pan, uh, three inches by three inches, equates to about a bushel an acre. Uh, so that's a little bit more accurate. The least accurate method is really trying to do seed counts. And that's the way uh, often uh, uh, growers, you know, you go out and you scrape away the straw and you blow away the chaff and you try to determine how much seed is left on the ground. With canola, black canola seed on black ground, it's very difficult to be accurate in terms of your assessment that way. 500 seeds in a square foot equates to approximately a, a half a bushel an acre of loss. Uh, but uh, those seeds, as you blow away that chaff, often you blow away a lot of the smaller seeds and uh, uh, it's very difficult to, to see all of that seed on the ground. So to wrap things up, uh, I said I, I would share a, a few links. Uh, on our new website, we do have an, an area uh, where videos are posted. So uh, we did an interview with Les Hill talking about his eight key uh, tips. Uh, that's available through the canolawatch.org uh, website. And uh, that's available there. We did a webinar last year with Les uh, covering this in much more detail. So that's available on our webinar page. And then uh, Finally, we did some interviews, uh, video interviews with the various manufacturers at our combine clinic in Westlock last year. So uh, they offer some specific tips for some of the various uh, models of combines that are available. And finally, just want to mention that uh, it's important to uh, stay safe when you're outside the combine. Uh, the only way to measure is, is with the combine in operation if you're looking at measuring those harvest losses and uh, that creates some risk in terms of safety so uh, it's really important to, uh, to be safe both from the standpoint of you know, uh, you know potential for hearing loss, dust and the impact that can have on your respiratory system but also just making sure everyone is aware of where everyone is in the field at all times. Um, so uh, with that, um, that wraps up what I had put together. Um, I'll get Allie to uh, open up uh, Angela's volume so she can also take some questions and uh, I'll pull out some of the questions that we've gotten through the course of the presentation and, and we can have a look at those.
but uh, in the meantime, for those of you that are CCAs or CCSC uh, um, members, uh, this is the code that you can submit. Um, uh, I see the slide here says it's one pest management CEU. I think that'll wind up being a crop uh, management uh, CEU credit. We're uh, just in the pending approval, final approval on that. Um, and the other thing that Ali mentioned is that uh, uh, the way our new website is set up, uh, we won't be able to post the link to the survey to submit your uh, CCA number and your name and, and particulars with the code until we post the video version of this webinar. So uh, that will be posted sometime in the next 24 hours and then you can go online. So jot this code down somewhere and uh, keep it handy and um, once it's posted then you'll be able to uh, submit the code uh, to make sure you're on the list to get your credits. So Angela, are you there now? Yeah, I'm here, Gerwin. Um, um, the first question was uh, uh, just asking about uh, any comments on desiccation. So I'll maybe, if you want to start and then I can jump in. Okay, you, uh, do you have direct comments to that, Derwin? I just, I guess, obviously you don't want to be desiccating too early. Uh, there was, a, I'm not sure if I included in my presentation, but just a slide uh, that I was looking at just showing the increased green seed and, and decreased yield um, from desiccating and then straight cutting. And my thoughts on that is probably it was just a, a timing issue, really. So if you're going to be desiccating, you want to uh, ensure that you have the timing uh, down pat. Yeah, I think uh, basically uh, that covers it. I guess the only other thing is to keep in mind, often uh, chatting with growers tend to kind of lump pre-harvest glyphosate and desiccation together. And uh, technically, if you're looking at a desiccant like Reglone, uh, it's going to uh, work much more quickly, and uh, once you've desiccated that crop, um, if typically would be looking at the desiccation option in a straight cutting situation. So once you have desiccated it, then it's very critical that you get in in a timely fashion as soon as that uh, seed is is cured enough and and ready to go, and not uh, wait too long because. Uh, uh, the, the true desiccants like Reglon are tissue disruptors and, and so that crop uh, will be uh, quite quite susceptible to shattering um, once once that desiccant takes effect. Um, the next question I think was for me, it, it's about Ligus and uh, the question was will Ligus feed on leaves? Um, if you aren't seeing any pod damage, but you're getting greater than 20 ligus per 10 sweep, should you spray? Um, I guess my comment on that, uh, certainly the ligus will feed on any succulent green tissue, uh, to my knowledge, uh, but uh, at this stage, the crop's not really drawing on uh, reserves from the leaves. If you're fully potted and starting to see some seed color change in the lower pods, the, the plant's really switching over to the dry down and senescence. So uh, photosynthetic capacity from the leaves is not really an, a benefit to yield at this point. Uh, so leaf feeding, uh, similar to with your, your cabbage worm larvae where they feed primarily on the leaves, unless the feeding is, is taking place on the pods, uh, odds are it's going to have minimal yield impact. So uh, certainly wouldn't want to, uh, you know, if, if pre-harvest intervals are a concern at that point, uh, certainly if you're that close to swathing, I, I would say, unless you're seeing them uh, feeding or seeing signs of the, of the spots on the, on the pods, likely not a good idea. Um, 
And the only other question was uh, another question related to Ligus, and it was a, a question about the number of generations per year. And I should know this off the top of my head. I'm pretty sure it's only two uh, generations, uh, but I'll I'll uh, open it up to Angela if she has. Uh, uh, two per year as well, Derwin, but now you've got me questioning if that's right. <laughs> I um, wanted to there, make just another quick comment with as far as uh, insect pests go. Um, myself here in Manitoba have been he seeing and hearing that there are tons of beneficials out there and they've um, also echoed that uh, sentiment in Saskatchewan and Alberta. So something also to keep in mind when you're considering uh, late season insecticide is that there is a lot of beneficials out there and you know there isn't enough resources for you to really know what those look like. but um, there is, if you go on the internet, you can find some pictures and, and maybe start identifying those yourself as well in your field. Right, and we actually just had a comment come in on the, on the question that uh, two per year in southern Alberta, likely only one per year red deer north. And, and so that's a great comment from Keith that uh, uh, obviously it does vary depending on your geography as well. Uh, here in southern Manitoba, again, lots of heat units, so uh, more likely to have that second generation. And, uh, you know, now would be the time that uh, at the tail end of the season when those second generation adults would be, would be coming in. Uh, so with that, um, it looks like that's all the questions that we had. Um, um, maybe just add one point that... Uh, uh, with regard to the, the question about uh, desiccation, again, is just um, Angela alluded to the fact that the real threat is, is going in too early uh, with regard to the desiccant. And um, so I think you really need to, whether it's pre-harvest uh, or a, an actual desiccant, you really need to think about what your goal is with that desiccation. I often hear the comment about evening up maturity and really what you're doing is killing off those immature plants prematurely. So you really need to look at what proportion of your yield does do those less mature plants represent and, and is it a sacrifice that you're willing to make. Um, and the other comment, I guess, with regard to pre-harvest is just to keep in mind that you need that seed moisture. Uh, below 30 percent uh, is the recommended timing. So that's likely going to be at or slightly beyond our old recommendation of 30 to 40 percent seed color change. Uh, so really um, that option um, is fairly limited if you're looking at a swathing situation because it's going to be difficult, especially with the hot dry weather we've been having this year, uh, to leave the crop long enough for that uh, for that pre-harvest to, to take full effect before you're going to have to be in there swathing that crop. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So with that, um, I think that's all the questions. So thanks again, Angela, for helping put this together today. Um, just... Uh, one last thing there again is our contact information. If any of you think of any questions or if you're viewing the recording and, and reviewing something and, and a question comes up, feel free to contact one of us. And then the last thing uh, I'll just mention, we'll likely be having another webinar in the series coming up in the not too distant future related to storage as we get uh, more of the crop in the bin. Uh, but the notices for all of those come out through our Canola Watch uh, distribution network. So if you're not so signed up uh, or you know of someone that might be interested in, in these agronomy webinars, uh, they can go to canolawatch.org and uh, get um, so that they're on that distribution list. So with that, uh, thanks everyone for attending. I know it's uh, harvest season and a busy time.